Welcome back to Martins and More. My name is Maury Rutch. And I'm Croakin' Spoon Phillips with laryngitis. <coughs> well, we have a really great show today, except for that part of it. Spoon, are you as excited as I am to talk about our very special guest? Absolutely, absolutely. I wouldn't miss it. That's why I'm here with, uh, as Croakin' Spoon Phillips. <coughs> oh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll do the talking for most of this. Please welcome Doug Young. Hello. Sorry about your voice. What? <laughs> I haven't gotten that kind of reception in a while. <laughs> oh, oh, is that right? I, I figured you were used to that everywhere you go. Now, before I assume too many things, last time we had a really talented fingerstyle guitar player on the set. Uh, I asked him if he knows Spoon Phillips, and I got an answer I wasn't ready for. So I just want to say before I ask you... I don't know how to put this, but I'm kind of a big deal. Really? People know me. <laughs> now, before I laugh at my own joke there, which one of you was Ron Burgundy in that situation? <laughs> perhaps, perhaps us both. <laughs> uh, I, don't be, I don't believe we met, but I know the name, and uh, I've, I've seen you around somewhere. I assume that was you playing in the introduction? Actually, yeah, that, is, that was yeah. me playing in the introduction. Um, it was beautiful. And, well, thank you. Well, that's, that's high praise indeed from uh, after, you know, hearing the music you put out uh, in several years now. Um, so well, why don't we just begin with a quick bio of uh, where did you originate um, and when did you end up where you are now? <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, well, yeah, so I grew up in Northeast Ohio. Uh, just Whereabouts? Out, uh, just outside of Kent. I'm from uh, Finley. Uh, and, uh -oh. oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I grew up in, you know, farm country outside of Kent. That was kind of going into town there. Um, and a lot of music going on there, of course. Um, I started playing guitar, I think, when I was in junior high. Um, I still remember buying my first uh, good guitar, which was... Um, a guitar I got from Nichols Five and Dime in Ravenna, Ohio, and I paid 18 bucks for it with my paper route money, <gasps> and uh, that kind of got me started, you know. And <laughs> uh, wow. I played in played in bands in in high school and college. Uh, played in the college jazz band, um, and when I got out of college, I, I I went to college for engineering, not music. Although I did take Ooh. some music classes. Um, when I got out of college, uh, I was having more fun playing in bands than, than engineering was. And uh, so for about the next 10 years, I kept playing in, in bands and traveling around, most, mostly the East Coast and Midwest and so on, uh, playing in bands wow. for about 10 years. Uh, and then at some point, I kind of woke up and realized that was probably not going to support me and a family the rest of my life, you know. Um, and... Um, I ended up getting uh, a job out in California, moved out to Silicon Valley in, I think it was 85 or 86. And um, I, I really didn't play very much for a while. You know, you're, you're busy with the day job and, and all that. Uh, I had sold most of my gear. I, I had, uh, I think I had a Yamaha acoustic that I hung on to. And uh, I think I had a 335. Um, but I didn't play very much, and, uh, and, and one of the issues really was being in a new environment. I didn't know anybody, and I wasn't sure I wanted to get back into playing in a band, but um, people would, you know, hear I played guitar and say, play something, and it always frustrated me, like, what, what am I going to do? You know, I, I, I could, uh, you know, play the play the solo to reeling in the ears or something for you that, that that's not very interesting <laughs> yeah. why 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 can't i play something by myself you know and uh one day i was in tower records in mountain view here where i am now mountain view california the currently the home of google and um uh i heard the narada fingerstyle cd playing on the radio and i went oh that i if i could play like that I'd just be happy. And and I wasn't new to fingerstyle. I I was familiar. I'd messed with John Renborn. Uh, I was into Joe Pass playing his solo stuff somewhat. Uh, I was aware of Alex DeGrassi, and I dabbled with Joni Mitchell and things like that, you know. But I just had never really recognized fingerstyle guitar as a, as a, as a thing you could do as opposed to playing electric lead or something, you know. Uh, so I bought that CD and went home and tried to tear it apart and figure out what the heck was going on and uh, just dove headfirst into fingerstyle guitar from that point on. 
Um, I released my first solo CD of all acoustic instrumentals, I think in 2003. And around 2005 or six, I put out a book on Dadgad, just kind of figuring I'd share what all the crap was that I had figured out. <laughs> and I uh, also started writing for acoustic guitar about that time. So um, that that's kind of, you know, and since then I've just carried on <laughs> doing wow. doing what I do and mostly focusing on finger style. Um, you, you mentioned going into the Neurata CD and trying to figure it out. I met a guy who had figured out a, uh, a uh, solo piece that somebody else had composed in an alternate tuning, and he figured it out in standard tuning, which was like a serious oh, yeah. acrobatic thing. And once he saw it, once he saw the guy actually play it in, I don't know, open G or dad cut or whatever it was, he was realized just how much extra work he was putting in. <laughs> um, well, you know, I was yeah. really ignorant. I, I was totally ignorant of alternate tunings growing up. I mean, in bands, when I was playing in bands, we were doing like Stones tunes and stuff, and I didn't know that Keith Richards was at Open G, so I'm trying to play it in standard. And it was like, man, this is hard, you know? And, yeah. and uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know. <laughs> and it is a tool, you know, it's a, it is a tool. Um, you know, I think some people come to open tunings because, oh, wow, this is really easy. I only need one finger. I only can, and I can, and like, play with a slide, and I don't need to play chords. But then you start to explore in there, and then you realize it opens up major vistas of, of yep. things that you simply can't do in standard tuning, you know, in terms of... Yep. Uh, um, you know, chord voicings and, and, uh, and, you know, flipping the bass on, you know, from the treble and that, you know, based on what you would normally do with standard tuning. So do you have favorite tunings? We're kind of jumping to tunings already, but. Uh, sure. Well, I mean, I, I probably, for me, home bass is dad gad. Um, it, it's, you know, for a lot of people, I think that's standard tuning, uh, an alternate standard tuning. Um, huh. and, and so it's, uh, that that's kind of my my center and and i i probably have every guitar in the room here and dad get right now i i, I would guess they they all seem to end up there um although this one's in standard um wow but um um you know i i play with other tunings open d is good uh open g is good um i've been playing a lot with uh c wahini lately which is just the uh, top four strings in standard uh fifth string down to g sixth string down to c which is kind of cool because you can play just like standard on the top four strings, and yet you got these big bottom bass notes. And somehow, even though that's not a huge change, it really opens up some nice rich chords. And mm. I've been having fun with yeah, that. Sure, sure. Um, the um, for people who are listening that may not be familiar with Dad Gad, that's this. That's it get, gets its name from the string. So you're dropping down the E's to D. So it's D A D G A D. Um, and very, you know, very common Celtic tuning in yep. uh, Great Britain and Ireland. Um, but again, yeah, but you, yeah. you know, you, but the moment you get into somebody's hands like yours or in a jazz player's hands, they come up with stuff that you, that Celtic players ne never dream of in terms of, uh, of other, uh, inversions that you can come up with and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's a really versatile tuning. And I, I, although I, you know, I think with any tuning, uh, one of the points that people don't often realize this, you still got the same 12 notes and it's really a matter of how deep you go into the tuning you know uh with dad gad uh you can play in any key you can um you can play any style um i've interviewed uh pierre ben Cezanne several times for acoustic guitar and uh i i knew i the last time i interviewed him i i knew this would i knew what it would do when i asked and i said you know a lot of people say you can only play in the key of d and dad gad and he went no 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 and he immediately went into a, a thing where he was playing Joe Pass like jazz and cycled through all 12 keys and uh, said, any key, you can do it. And I, I knew he would do that. So <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> it was a good demonstration. <laughs> it was funny. Good. This past NAS Fest, I, I run into Tunnel Vision, too, and we were playing a big song circle of like 17 people. And I had my guitar tuned to open E for the song I was going to do, and it was my turn. And somebody played something in G, and I'm just sitting there, and Spoon's like, just capo at the third fret. I was like, well, yeah. oh, yeah. I don't think to do anything but what, the, what it's named. And then mm -hmm. as soon as you realize that's just a starting point, or maybe not even capoing, playing out of that key just because it's in that, you can play the notes that are anywhere. But I don't think that way until somebody next to me at 3.30 in the morning just punches me in the arm, you know? Well, a lot of times uh, in an alternate tuning, the, the obvious key, the obvious chord, you know, 
uh, can be used in other ways. Like in open G, you might play in the key of D, and then the G chord becomes your four chord. And so you've got a cool, big, open four chord. Um, and so, you know, all these things are, are, are possible. It's just leveraging those open strings into chord voices you get in a different way. So how many records do you have now out there? Um, well, let's see. I released, uh, I, I, I put this first one out in 2003. It's called Laurel Mill. Uh, about 2011, I think, I did a, a CD, a solo CD called Closing Time. Um, I did a Christmas CD on the during the pandemic. That was fun. I actually uh, recorded a whole pile of Christmas tunes, and I drug in a bunch of friends because we were all sitting around during lockdown with nothing to do. And so it's got cello and strings and uh, flute and, and things on it, and that was kind of fun because I don't usually do that. Um, I've got uh, the duet CD with Taya Gherkin. Um, I think that's about it. Love that one. Yeah, that's, yeah, a, big, that's, uh, a, that's a big record for Mari and I. That's a, that's a oh, favorite. good. I'm glad glad yeah. you like it. Yeah, that uh, that was a lot of fun, and and that was a pre lockdown project. We've done a we've probably done a CD's worth of stuff since then, but we haven't. You know, CDs are fading away. Um, <laughs> so we've released them as singles, and I've been doing the same thing. I, I At the beginning of last year, I sat down and said, okay, I haven't put out a, a recording in a while. What do, what do I got? You know, what tongs, tunes have I written or arranged and haven't released? And I wrote them all down, and, geez, I've got like 50 songs that I had not put out. Um, really? And, and so I put them in a spreadsheet, and I put out about 20 last year as singles, so there's a CD's worth, but it's not a CD. It's just out on Spotify and many more to go. And I keep writing them faster than I'm releasing them. So I don't know if I'll ever catch up with the list. <laughs> Fascinating, because wow. I was actually going to ask you about the, your two first uh, solo CDs. Is if, if you did them as an album in any way thematically or, or it just happened to be these are the tunes that I have going right now. Yeah, they were just the tunes I had going at the time. Um, I mean, if there was a theme, it's just uh, a matter of a, a point in time of whatever I was able yeah. to do or interested in doing at that time. Uh, the first one, Laurel Mill, I named I named that after uh, uh, a, a little retreat in the Los Gatos Mountains down here. Used to be a nudist camp, I guess, but now it's uh, more of a of a you know rental facility for anybody. And uh, Alex DeGrassi ran some summer camps there for a while, and I attended one of those. And that was a lot of fun. Not only Alex, but a ton of other really good players hanging out for a week, and uh, I wow. wrote a couple wrote a couple tunes or got them started while I was there. So I named the, the including a tune called Laurel Mill. So I, I named the album after that. So a little bit of a theme there, but not not particularly. Hmm. Well, you mentioned Taya a few minutes ago, and I think it's important that most of our listeners know that Taya was kind of the gateway drug for us to get you on the program. And I didn't ask him at the time, but I should ask you because now he can't stick up for himself. Do you think he's okay opening up for you like this? <laughs> well, because we, he was we on the show a, first. You know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> he's a good opening act to have. Um, we we kind of open for each other because we because we play a lot uh, together and do a lot of sure. do a lot of duo gigs. Uh, that's been my uh, my main live performance opportunities over the last well since COVID started up have mostly been gigs with Taya. We just uh, we just played a gig a couple of weeks ago that was uh, totally crazy. We played uh, for an art gallery for a uh, debut of an artist who was uh, very abstract. Um, his his paintings are you know modern art, and we composed a tune. I, I, I'll use composed loosely, but we, uh, <laughs> we 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 debuted a tune to match his paintings, and it involved uh, Taya playing four different guitars at once, and I played a little uh, Valette Griffin, uh, the little little tiny baby thing, and it was largely improvised, and it was you know Taya going around hitting different strings on the guitar while <laughs> I tried to really? sort of glue it glue it together with my uh, with my little Griffin. Uh, wow. And it was a, uh, it was, it was fun. They they videoed it, so someday there'll be a video coming out. We'll see. How I was going to say, out. is that going to be available <laughs> online? Yeah. Um, now you are available online in multiple places, so you have your own website, uh, yep. which is called just dougyoungguitar dot com. <laughs> and but then you also uh, are involved, um, like you said, you used to be at Acoustic Guitar Magazine at the same time Taylor Gherkin was. 
and and now uh, you guys um, you do lessons and and things on video as well at what's that website? Uh, yeah, so I I do teach a course on Peghead Nation on alternate tunings where we go through some of the stuff we were just talking about. You know how to make sense of an alternate tuning, how to play maybe in different keys, and how to how to do more than just uh, take advantage of the the basic open string sound. Uh, so that's PegheadNation.com. And there's lots of other the, great lessons the, there, too. Yeah, zillions of artists in lessons. So very, very rich yeah. resource. Um, so, And I do right. still write for acoustic guitar. I, I've, I actually just sent them a couple of uh, articles in the last few weeks. So that, oh, right. That, uh, that's cool. still going on. Awesome. Anything uh, super secret you're not supposed to tell anybody that you want to tell us? <laughs> then the world would know, right? <laughs> that's, that's a trick no, question I don't for think sure. That, yeah, I don't think there's any uh, uh, any secret plans going on at the moment. Um, Let me phrase it a different way. Is there anything brand new coming out that you're very excited about and you ah, can just say yes or no and not tell us anything about it? Oh, I see. Um, well, I do have the, the most recent article for Acoustic Guitar will be coming out here probably in the next month or so. That, that was kind of fun. They, they asked me to... Um, the list uh, 10 important recordings in fingerstyle guitar over the years, which proved to be a, a an impossible task. You know, you start listing and go, well, I can't do 10. Maybe I could do 100. No, I'm not <laughs> even sure 100 is enough. And so you, I had to, and, and on, then to top it off, what they wanted me to do was talk about them. And then, because they don't want to do copyrights and things, they wanted me to compose music that was in the spirit of each of these pieces. So uh, wow. I ended up... Picking ten that you know, I'm sure there'll be people, there's plenty to quibble with of who I left out, put it that way. Um, but I picked ten that that I liked that I thought represented some flow of modern fingerstyle, modern being starting in the '60s or so and moving on. And then oh, I had wow. to uh, compose short little sound-alike versions of it, and that that was uh, that was a fun exercise. I it's actually kind of kind of an interesting thing to do to sit down and say uh, how can I write a song that sounds like John Renborn or James Taylor or Alex DeGrasse, you know, and try to try to compose something. Fortunately, they were short. I only had to do like, you know, eight <laughs> measures of something for them. Mm, so, more than I could do. Fascinating. No, I look very forward to that then too, because I, um, I remember reading an interview with uh, Elvis Costello and he said I, he wanted to write a, a band song, a Robbie Robertson song, and it ended up being um, Sneaky Feelings on his first record, which sounds nothing like a band song, but sure. that was that was his jumping off point, and I've tried to do similar things, and I it ends up just being an inspiration, and I don't I've never done a very good job of of uh, you know doing a counterfeit Leo Kotke say or something like that. So I'm looking very forward to seeing what you came up with. So yeah, right. yeah, I you know it'll be interesting to see if anybody believes I I nailed the sound, but I found that same thing. I said, well, this is actually a good idea. Take take. Just listen to somebody else's tune. You're not, not stealing it. Just take it as that inspiration because you're not going to copy it. You're gonna you're gonna use it as a departure point and come up with something of your own. So I may try to do more of that. It's just kind of nice to come up with a, a way of getting some inspiration. It's also nice to to start with something that you can't possibly do. You know, listen to. Uh, I, I was just listening to uh, a, a a competing podcast uh, the other day where the guy was talking about how he created a fingerstyle arrangement of a Copeland clarinet sonata and i i went oh okay well that's you know mm. that that's a way to be sure that you won't be copying the original but it's inspiration <laughs> and sure, it's weird because sure. the more accurate you got you'd probably be in trouble if you did a really really good job they'd be yep. like well no that we can't pay for that so make it worse yeah mm -hmm. but it you know the idea is likely you you won't you'll likely come up with something totally new it's just a a, a launching point always looking for inspiration so so you, uh, you know, you, you write some very, I guess, evocative, uh, uh, you know, instrumentals, and, but you're also very adept at doing um, interpretations and arrangements of known songs. And, uh, and you had supplied us with some videos, and unfortunately, one of them we cannot share with the audience today because of copyright restrictions, was you doing a cover of If I Needed Someone, uh, the Beatles tune, the George Harrison tune, and um, which I thought was just, you know, uh, gear fab, if I may say. And um, and I was wondering, I'm guessing that the guitar we're using, basing listing on it, was that 
a Martin Lawrence Juber signature model, and from the high trebles, it sounded like a Madagascar Rosewood. So what were uh, you actually playing? That tune I played on this guitar that I'm holding here. Which oh, is I'm sorry, a, I got my tunes mixed yeah. up. That's the Schoenberg. Yeah, that's the Schoenberg. Uh, it's yeah, that's a, a 12, uh, 12 fret cutaway. Is that it's correct? A 12 fret, it's a triple O, uh, 12 fret cutaway. It is uh, Coca Bola. I don't know if people are going to see any of this. Uh, Coca Bola <laughs> back in size. And uh, this is built by Bruce Sexauer. And oh, um, of course. It's, uh, it's just a, it's a very, you know, it's a Martin esque guitar. Um, but uh, yeah, that's what I used on. On uh, yeah. pretty sure that's I was going to guess if I needed uh, someone. I was going to guess uh, Brazilian rosewood on that. It's got very. It's really uh, dark. Great depth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's very dark. Uh, often uh, coca bola and Brazilian can be mistaken just because there's the dark and the grain. Uh, yeah. well, I just the, mean the sound, the way that it, the bass sounded and stuff. Uh, I want to let our audience know that you can watch that video of Doug playing the Beatles tune. If you're a Patreon member, that's going to be a secret uh, video on our Patreon service. So don't fret. You Don't fret. See what I did there? You can actually see that. <laughs> and uh, Doug was nice enough to send three videos. Of the three videos you sent, one is the Beatles tune we can't show today, but two of them were original material. I know Autumn Rhodes was there, and another mm -hmm. tune. Are either one of those videos showcasing the guitar Spoon thought you were playing? Yes, Autumn Rhodes, I believe, I played on the Martin. I can grab that. It's right here. I've got a couple interesting... I, I, I played a couple tunes on Martins, because this is a Martin show, right? Or at least that's the <laughs> name. Um, so this is a... Uh, I'm, I'm now holding uh, the uh, Lawrence Juber Martin. Um, this is one, you know, Lawrence uh, initially, I believe, did a run of Indian Rosewood models, uh, custom, through the custom shop, that were uh, Indian Rosewood back in size. I think there was something like 100 or 150 of those made. And then they did this small run of 50 in with Brazilian. And that's what this is. This is, uh, let's see if I can see it. This is number 30 out of 50 uh, of the Brazilian Rosewood I've, run. I've had a couple of them, but I had to give them up because I can't play V-necks anymore on my hands, but... It does have a slight V. Uh, I don't. I don't mind it at all. It's it's a. Uh, it's not an extreme V, but it's definitely more V than any other guitar I've got. Um, and, and the guitar sounds great. I like it. Um, it's it's a. Uh, you know, I've got a Dazzo pickup in it, so I do use it sometimes live. It sounds pretty good that way. Um, and just all in all, it's just a you know great, very playable guitar. And uh, has has a, a really nice uh, sound. You know, it's not unlike the show, the Schoenbergs are essentially trying to mimic this kind of guitar. It's got the Schoenberg style cutaway. Uh, the Schoenbergs were basically a a Martin Custom Shop guitar originally, and uh, so in some ways it's a similar similar feel, similar type of guitar. Yeah, and they're and different the other, than Bruce's other guitars. His Schoenbergs are not like his other guitars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, they're much more Martin. I, I just, I took, uh, when I got this uh, Schoenberg, I stopped by at Bruce's and showed it to him. It's a 2005, the uh, the, the Schoenberg slash sex hour. And uh, he commented on that, that, you know, this is uh, my, my, the guitars he builds for Eric are more Martin-y than, than Bruce's other guitars. Why don't we pause for a moment and listen to a sound sample of Doug's Brazilian Lawrence Juber.
Thank you. Uh, yeah, so that's the Juber. Um, you know, so I, I've got that. I've got another Martin here handy, which is fun. Um, now I was going to look uh, at that. Now, let me see if I can guess that one. That looks like a 0018. Triple O. Was it a 0021? Triple O 18. Triple O. Oh, it's a triple O 18. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it looks yeah. smaller wow. up against your body. So is this pre-1930? This is a 1926. Yeah. And wow. um, this actually was previously owned by Al Petaway. I bought it from Al oh. um, a few years oh. ago. He was uh, raising raising funds, I think, for putting in a new driveway or something. And he uh, decided he was going to part with this guy. And... Um, you know, I told him I'd buy it, and if he ever got in a position where he wanted it back, I'd I'd just be the character keeper. You know, with a guitar like this, we're all just character uh-huh. keepers for for a while. And uh, but unfortunately, Al isn't uh, around anymore, so he's uh, unfortunately won't be getting it back. But it was a real, it's a really cool guitar. Uh, it's in you know for a hundred year old guitar almost. It's in pretty good shape. Uh, some scratches and things, but uh, and it somebody at some point put stickers on it. And it's got sort of suntan lines from flower oh. stickers all over the top, which uh, groovy. Which I think, yeah, I think it's really cool. It's like you know, some some uh, some hippie in the '60s probably had the guitar and put flower power stickers all over it. Uh, but it's a it's a really great guitar. It just has a really open, huge sound. And it's surprisingly easy to play. It also has. I guess a slight V, actually less than a Juber, um, but it's pretty. How wide is neck. that neck? Uh, it's one and seven eighths, Yo. quite wide, and I think it's uh, two and three eighths down here, spra- uh, string spacing at the oh, saddle. Sound, yeah, that sounds yeah. right. Which I really like. Wow. I mean, for finger style, uh, having a little extra room in there. Uh, you play a guitar like this for a while, and then I go back to. My other guitars, and it's like, oh, why, why am I so cramped up? You know. Well, yeah. it's also some of the genius of the old Martin X is that they, they don't feel as wide as they are. They're not bulky, particularly on that first position. They're not nearly as bulky as what you get into in the '30s and '40s. Yeah. Um, so beautiful. This was, uh, I think, 26. I'm a little confused. I see uh, uh, conflicting information online, but it's at least one of the first years in which they offered a steel string as a, as a production model. Uh, there were steel mm-hmm. strings before that. One one thing I read, I thought that was maybe on the Martin site, was that uh, they offered steel string by custom order before that. But in two thousand in twenty six, this became the the default was steel. Yeah, I think that's but, right. They started in nineteen nineteen, but they were really wow. kind of hybrid where you could use either gut strings uh-huh. or steel strings. And but then by the time you get into twenty six, that you're right. That's exactly when they really were going. You know. All, all out steel string until really wasn't until 30 with the om that they built a guitar yeah. you know four steel strings but but these are uh yeah it's just a very sweet spot guitar for a i didn't realize it was a triple o when i saw it online i thought for sure it was a double o but uh, so it's a long scale so um yeah 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 well, yeah yeah fun really a uh, really nice guitar and it records beautifully it's still it's had some uh, i mean it doesn't have the bar frets anymore it's been refretted um it does have the original tuners, which are extremely high ratio. You just sort of breathe on them, and uh, huh. the tuning changes quite a bit. Um, but all in all, it's a, a really, really nice guitar. I'll put a K&K pickup in it, which sounds incredible. The guitar is so light, it weighs nothing. And um, I think the fact that the light, the guitar is so lightly constructed and so dry and responsive, everything really works well with the pickup. So, well, you mentioned it yeah. records really well, and I, I can't resist a good segue. Is now a good time to ask you about the recording that you do for yourself and for other people? Sure. Um, yeah, what would you like to know? <laughs> well, I, I, um, I know that in, in passing, we've talked uh, a lot of times online, whether it was you know personal emails or in forum projects and uh, forum responses that everybody takes part in, and there's no doubt that whenever somebody's looking for advice on pickups or recording, or mastering or doing those sorts of things. You get a lot of people that want to try to help. And then here comes Doug Young and it's like, oh, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's just, I, I want to be able to, you kind of owe me the opportunity to pick your brain, like it or not, now that you're on, on our show. And I just want <laughs> sure. to tell you that uh, the work you've done over the years that, that you uh, have brought so much help to people in that regard, I don't mean for you to go and, and literally uh, talk about anything specific, but what, you know, bring our listeners 
some uh, some enjoyment about what you know and what you help people know when it comes to recording the guitar, mastering things like that, and just uh, take that as a jump off point. But I'm, I'm I want to hear what this what this sounds like. Okay, well, well, so I'm sitting in my studio here, um, and um, I built this room. I think the most important thing about recording, especially acoustic guitar, is the room acoustics. Um, it's a it's the thing that's the most difficult and most times when somebody first starts getting into recording and we see this all the time people posting on forums they record and then they go yuck why does it sound so bad well it sounds bad mostly because the guitar interacts with the room and microphones hear things differently than our ears hear so we might think we sound good singing in the shower but the microphones are not going to think that sounds good <laughs> and uh so uh you you don't typically sound good just sitting in your uh, for a recording just sitting in a, a a normal room sitting in a bedroom or your living room or something. So uh, I'm in a room that I put a lot of effort into the the sound. This room actually started out uh, as my son's band room. It was uh, uh, one of those lucky accidents for me. Uh, my son had a had a band in junior high. They uh, they brought in drums and Marshall stacks and pizza boxes and whatnot and started playing and the whole house shook and the neighbors lined up out front saying, how long is this going to go on? So <laughs> in, in, in order to not be evicted from the neighborhood, I told the boys that if they'd provide the labor, I'd help them soundproof the garage. So we built a room in a room in the garage. We insulated the garage. Then we built the room in the room, insulated that. And when we were yeah. done, they could be in here blowing their brains out, and outside you couldn't hear anything. Excellent. So when my son grew up, and uh, I said, hey, maybe we can get our garage back. And my wife said, why would you do that? Make that be your studio. And I went, oh, okay. So uh, a little bit of work uh, to make it look a little nicer than it did when they were in here. And and, and to focus <laughs> not on keeping the sound from going out of the house, but to focus on the, the sound quality in the room. Uh, and I did that. It's it's been a while. I've had this room for twenty years now, probably, um, and it's worked out pretty well. So that's the first thing is you know have have some decent room acoustics, uh, and then microphones and mic placement matter a lot. Um, I've got a bunch of different microphones that I've tried over the years. I'm not sure that the actual mics matter all that much, but. It's just like guitars. You always think the next one will make some big difference, and I, I keep falling for that myself. You know, oh, another <laughs> mic that'll that'll work, and uh, they are all different, just like guitars. They all they can all sound good, but they all have a slightly different behavior and different sound. So I've tried lots of different microphones, um, but the main thing with guitar is you know it's it's pretty um, pure. You just want to put a couple good mics in front of the guitar. You got you want to have a good sounding guitar in a good sounding room with good mics put it in front of it, hit record, and that ought to sound really good without doing anything at all. What are those mics that you were using for these videos? Uh, for the videos, I'm using what I've got set up right here. I've got, I started, I, I did a little extra setup here during COVID because I was doing a lot of, of uh, both lessons online. I did a bunch of workshops online. Uh, I did a monthly or bi-monthly or something performance series all through covid where we webcast a concert with other people using ecamm uh so i rigged up my desk with mics that i can just reach out and pull them out of my desk i don't know if you can see them here uh as well as lights and and cameras i've got a, a camera switcher here i can actually uh cut yeah. change my camera angle this is good for lessons when i'm giving lessons to people i can say oh here look at my hands up close and i can just uh, switch between a couple different camera views so anyway, the mics that are set up here under my desk are uh, Gefell uh, M300s, I believe. I would get confused. They're either 300s or 295s. <laughs> um, they're just <laughs> little pen pencil mics. Um, I picked those up here a while back. They're kind of popular. A number of people have, have used them, and I got a good deal on some. And I said, oh, those would be great to put on my desk. So I don't typically record with these. I use them for this kind of thing. Um, for recording, I don't know if you can see, let's see, if I cut my view over there in the corner, you can probably see a bunch of mics, probably hard to make sense of. Yeah. Um, I've got uh, a pair of uh, Bronner, or Browner, I'm not sure how you say it, it's the German name, uh, VM1s, which are uh, a tube, large diaphragm condenser mic setup. Uh, and I've also got a pair of uh, Telefunken uh, Elam 260s, they're small pencil tube mics. And I also use uh, Shep's CMC6 uh, MK41s, hypercardioid mics, quite a bit. All those are, are you know, really nice mics. 
<laughs> you tend, and when you do an acoustic uh, steel string guitar, do you tend to use the large diaphragm and small diaphragm mics in the same recordings? I usually record, in fact, I've got a third mic set up over here, which is a ribbon. I got the AEA ribbon, which is this monstrous thing. It looks like a dirigible, and it's a stereo ribbon mic. I usually record with all three of them, but I may not use them all in the recording. I may. Sure. It, it's more of a choice thing. You know, it's more like I don't know which one's going to sound best to me, and I'm not sure if it's a matter of which sounds really sounds best on the car more than what my mood is on that day. But some mm -hmm. days I'll listen back, and, oh, I like the ribbon on this one, and so I can pick that and other days I and, and often I pick one and then come back the next day and go oh no no the other mic sounded much better so it's usually a matter of choice sometimes I blend them but more often than not I just pick one an artist <laughs> in other words yeah you, you <laughs> I mean it's it's like if I could I'd record on all a bunch of guitars all at once <laughs> and pick the guitar that sounds the best and I have done that on on recordings I've recorded something on a guitar and and said you know I think it sound better on a different one and and try it over um, usually you're chasing your tail, but you know, Hey, it's, it's, it's all fun. Right. So do you ever, even for a moment, start, get into a, like you talk about moods. Do you ever become so interested in recording that you'd rather record than play? Yeah. Recording's its own thing. I think that's, yeah, absolutely. I think you can, <clears throat> you can easily get into a thing where that's, that's the real, uh, the real hobby, you know? Or, or the real vocation is to, to record. Uh, especially if you're getting a good sound. It's kind of like, oh, that's how I want my guitars to sound. And, and yeah. I usually have the opposite problem. I'm usually more disappointed. I, even though I, I, I'm you know, not unhappy with most of the recordings I make, uh, I usually feel like they fail to capture what I hear when I'm playing. You know, you're, really? you're playing the guitar. You? Yeah, you, yeah, you play the guitar and you're sitting here going, oh man, listen to the guitar swirling all around me. And then you record it and you go, Oh, it's just the sound coming back through speakers. It's not, not as three dimensional. Uh, difficult to capture. When I recorded my album, I the very last piece that I recorded, I was like, "That's the sound I want," but there was no way I could afford to go back and redo everything. So there's like one song on the entire album that sounds the way I want things to sound and <laughs> doesn't have you know the rooms not in, intruding so much and all that. But yeah. But um, and it's basically the same setup. I had to reset up every time because I was running somebody else's studio, and there was not much difference into what I did with the mics and where the you know the blacks were to help muffle things and stuff. But for some reason, it was just the right angle, right place, right exact right placement, and and you know again I you know I literally would have started over and done the whole thing at that point forward with that setup and not leave, left the room. <laughs> It just, yeah. you know, said, call in sandwiches. I'm not leaving until I do these 10 songs <laughs> over. I couldn't do it. Uh -huh. I've definitely had that. I've, I've had times where I've set up the mics and, and recorded something and went, wow, that's it. That's it. Don't touch anything, you know. But then you come back the next day and, no, it's not there anymore. Um, it, it, it's a funny thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the other thing is we're, we're usually super critical. I mean, one of the things that happens when I, as far as rather than recording than playing, is I'll, re I'll, I'll have a tune that I think sounds good. And then I record it, and I listen back and go, oh, man, you know, I, I need to work on the arrangement, or I'm not playing it that well, or something has to happen. Um, and so in a way, it's good. That's critical. Uh, you know, you're being critical, and you improve things, and I go back and rework the arrangement or something. It's also uh, sometimes fun just to work on other people's material where you don't have that going on. You know, I'm, if I'm mixing or mastering somebody else's tune, uh, I just take it what, the, what they did and say, what can I do with this? And that way I'm not being uh, self-critical while I'm working on it. And that, that's kind of fun. So I just did uh, the mastering on, uh, mixing and mastering on uh, Taya Gherkin's new CD, which uh, I think turned out really well. He recorded it really well, some great tunes, great playing. So that was, that was actually really easy because it, it just, I had good raw material to, to start with. Um, I've done some things for a few other people. Uh, I mastered a CD I think that was during the pandemic for uh, Frank Guidry and uh, Led Capana, the uh, the flat key master, and uh, <laughs> that was that was cool duet CD with them. Uh, and I uh, wow. did some things for uh, I've done some things for Anton Emery, who's a wonderful Celtic player up in Portland. Recorded <laughs> some stuff for him. Um, it's kind of you know it's kind of nice to work with other people, 
and uh, not not have your own, uh, not be the artist that you're being critical when, when you're working on the mix and you're worrying about how much reverb and all of a sudden you just go, you know, this song isn't that good. I need to start over with the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, not enough reverb is going to fix this. Yeah. All right, before exactly. we go off of this topic and before we alienate some of our uh, more casual players uh, that never have to deal with this stuff, can, uh, can you tell me what software you use and what are your... Do you use different preamps depending on the mic, or what, what preamps do you prefer? Okay, so, well, preamps, I've got, uh, I've got a bunch of choices. First of all, I've got a, uh, an interface that's a, an Apogee Ensemble interface, uh, and that has preamps built in. They're fine. I can use those. But because over the years I've accumulated some other external preamps, I usually plug those in instead. And I've got a, an old Great River MPH, M, MP2H, I believe it is. They don't make them anymore. It's a very just a very clean, uh, nice preamp, and I've had that for years. I use that for a lot of things. I have an AEA uh, RPQ preamp, which is a ribbon preamp, so I use that for the ribbon mics. Very high gain, very <laughs> quiet, designed specifically for ribbon mics. And then I have a uh, uh, La Chapelle something or other. I forget the model number here. 880 no I, I forget the model but it's a it's a tube preamp and uh, I use that for a lot of things and it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with I mean I could definitely play games and say does this preamp sound better with this mic but that's usually a level of detail I don't go into it's more like this is what I got wired up let's let's see it, it seems to sound okay software wise uh, I usually use uh, logic on on the Mac hmm. and I've played with other things there's not a huge difference i mean there's there's almost no raw difference in sound as far as what gets recorded then there are differences in the workflow and what you can do in it and the the sound of different plugins and all that kind of stuff but uh so that that's really uh logic's the base and then i i'm constantly playing around with new plugins there's there's always there's so so much cool processing and it's kind of interesting because yeah. you know a lot of processing is aimed at making crazy sounds, you know, do, doing synthesizers and virtual instruments and all that stuff. And, of course, with acoustic music, I don't care about any of that. I'm just looking for anything that would... I'm looking for any effect that would make the guitar sound more like there's no effects on it. More more ah. like it's just the natural sound of the guitar. So anything I can do, <laughs> again, to, I think it comes back to what do I hear while I'm playing the guitar and can I reproduce that coming back over the speakers? So anything that helps me bring out the sound that, that I'm hearing... Um, sometimes it takes uh, a, a bit of processing to do that. I failed to mention this episode's brought to you by our Patreon members. Join our growing community and enjoy early access to every episode, exclusive video versions of the podcast, behind the scenes footage, full length product demos, and so much more. We appreciate you. Sorry, folks, all the editing in the world isn't going to make this fit into one episode. I'm afraid we're going to have to invite you back next week for part two of Doug Young. From one of us at Martins and More, thanks for listening.